Chapter 5 The sails flapped over their heads. The water chuckled and slapped the sides of the boat, which drowsed motionless in the sun. Now and then the sails rippled with a little breeze in them, but the ripple ran over them and ceased. The boat made no motion at all. Mr. Ramsay sat in the middle of the boat. He would be impatient in a moment, James thought, and Cam thought, looking at her father, who sat in the middle of the boat between them. James steered, Cam sat alone in the bow, with his legs tightly curled. He hated hanging about. Sure enough, after fidgeting a second or two, he said something sharp to McAllister's boy, who got out his oars and began to row. But their father, they knew, would never be content until they were flying along. He would keep looking for a breeze, fidgeting, saying things under his breath, which McAllister and McAllister's boy would overhear, and they would both be made horribly uncomfortable. He had made them come. He had forced them to come. In their anger, they hoped that the breeze would never rise, that he might be thwarted in every possible way, since he had forced them to come against their wills. All the way down to the beach they had lagged behind together, though he bade them walk up, walk up, without speaking. Their heads were bent down, their heads were pressed down by some remorseless gale. Speak to him they could not. They must come, they must follow, they must walk behind him carrying brown paper parcels. But they vowed, in silence as they walked, to stand by each other and carry out the great compact, to resist tyranny to the death. So there they would sit, one at one end of the boat, one at the other, in silence. They would say nothing, only look at him now and then, where he sat with his legs twisted, frowning and fidgeting, and pishing and shoring and muttering things to himself, and waiting impatiently for a breeze. And they hoped it would be calm. They hoped he would be thwarted. They hoped the whole expedition would fail, and they would have to put back, with their parcels, to the beach. But now, when McAllister's boy had rowed a little way out, the sails slowly swung round, the boat quickened itself, flattened itself, and shot off. Instantly, as if some great strain had been relieved, Mr. Ramsay uncurled his legs, took out his tobacco pouch, handed it with a little grunt to McAllister, and felt, they knew, for all they suffered, perfectly content. Now they would sail on for hours like this, and Mr. Ramsay would ask old McAllister a question, about the great storm last winter, probably, and old McAllister would answer it, and they would puff their pipes together, and McAllister would take a tarry rope in his fingers, tying or untying some knot, and the boy would fish and never say a word to anyone. James would be forced to keep his eye all the time on the sail, for if he forgot, then the sail puckered and shivered, and the boat slackened, and Mr. Ramsay would say sharply, Look out! Look out! And old McAllister would turn slowly on his seat. So they heard Mr. Ramsay asking some question about the great storm at Christmas. She comes driving round the point, old McAllister said, describing the great storm last Christmas, when ten ships had been driven into the bay for shelter, and he had seen one there, one there, one there. He pointed slowly round the bay. Mr. Ramsay followed him, turning his head. He had seen four men clinging to the mast. Then she was gone. And at last we shoved her off, he went on. But in their anger and their silence, they only caught a word here and there, sitting at opposite ends of the boat, united by their compact to fight tyranny to the death. At last they had shoved her off, they had launched the lifeboat, and they had got her out past the point. McAllister told the story, and though they only caught a word here and there, they were conscious all the time of their father, how he leant forward, how he brought his voice into tune with McAllister's voice, how, puffing at his pipe, and looking there and there where McAllister pointed, 
he relished the thought of the storm and the dark night and the fishermen striving there. He liked that men should labour and sweat on the windy beach at night, pitting muscle and brain against the waves and the wind. He liked men to work like that, and women to keep house, and sit beside sleeping children indoors, while men were drowned out there in a storm. So James could tell, so Cam could tell. They looked at him, they looked at each other, from his toss and his vigilance and the ring in his voice, and the little tinge of Scottish accent which came into his voice, making him seem like a peasant himself, as he questioned McAllister about the eleven ships that had been driven into the bay in a storm. Three had sunk. He looked proudly where McAllister pointed, and Cam thought, feeling proud of him, without knowing quite why. Had he been there, he would have launched the lifeboat, he would have reached the wreck, Cam thought. He was so brave, he was so adventurous, Cam thought. But she remembered. There was the compact to resist tyranny to the death. Their grievance weighed them down. They had been forced. They had been bidden. He had borne them down once more with his gloom and his authority, making them do his bidding on this fine morning. Come, because he wished it, carrying these parcels to the lighthouse. Take part in these rites he went through for his own pleasure in memory of dead people, which they hated, so that they lagged after him. All the pleasure of the day was spoilt. Yes, the breeze was freshening. The boat was leaning. The water was sliced sharply and fell away in green cascades, in bubbles, in cataracts. Cam looked down into the foam, into the sea with all its treasure in it, and its speed hypnotised her, and the tie between her and James sagged a little. It slackened a little. She began to think, how fast it goes. Where are we going? And the movement hypnotised her. While James, with his eye fixed on the sail and on the horizon, steered grimly. But he began to think, as he steered, that he might escape, he might be quit of it all. They might land somewhere and be free then. Both of them, looking at each other for a moment, had a sense of escape and exultation, what with the speed and the change. But the breeze bred in Mr. Ramsay too the same excitement, and, as old McAllister turned to fling his line overboard, he cried out aloud, We perished. And then again, each alone. And then, with his usual spasm of repentance or shyness, pulled himself up and waved his hand towards the shore. See the little house, he said, pointing, wishing Cam to look. She raised herself reluctantly and looked. But which was it? She could no longer make out, there on the hillside, which was their house. All looked distant and peaceful and strange. The shore seemed refined, far away, unreal. Already the little distance they had sailed had put them far from it, and given it the changed look, the composed look, of something receding in which one has no longer any part. Which was their house. She could not see it. But I beneath a rougher sea, Mr. Ramsay murmured. He had found the house, and so seeing it, he had also seen himself there. He had seen himself walking on the terrace, alone. He was walking up and down between the urns, and he seemed to himself very old and bowed. Sitting in the boat, he bowed, he crouched himself, acting instantly his part, the part of a desolate man, widowed, bereft and so called up before him in hosts people sympathising with him, staged for himself as he sat in the boat, a little drama, which required of him decrepitude and exhaustion and sorrow. He raised his hands and looked at the thinness of them to confirm his dream. And then there was given him in abundance women's sympathy, and he imagined how they would soothe him and sympathise with him, and so getting in his dream some reflection of the exquisite pleasure women's sympathy was to him. He sighed, and said gently and mournfully, 
But I, beneath the rougher sea, was whelmed in deeper gulfs than he, so that the mournful words were heard quite clearly by them all. Cam half started on her seat. It shocked her. It outraged her. The movement roused her father, and he shuddered and broke off, exclaiming, Look! Look! So urgently that James also turned his head to look over his shoulder at the island. They all looked. They looked at the island. But Cam could see nothing. She was thinking how all those paths and the lawn, thick and knotted with the lives they had lived there, were gone, were rubbed out, were past, were unreal, and now this was real. The boat and the sail with its patch, McAllister with his earrings, the noise of the waves, all this was real. Thinking this, she was murmuring to herself, we perished, each alone. For her father's words broke and broke again in her mind, when her father, seeing her gazing so vaguely, began to tease her. Didn't she know the points of the compass? he asked. Didn't she know the north from the south? Did she really think they lived right out there? And he pointed again, and showed her where their house was, there, by those trees. He wished she would try to be more accurate, he said, Tell me, which is east, which is west? He said, half laughing at her, half scolding her, for he could not understand the state of mind of any one, not absolutely imbecile, who did not know the points of the compass. Yet she did not know. And seeing her gazing, with her vague, now rather frightened eyes, fixed where no house was, Mr. Ramsay forgot his dream, how he walked up and down between the urns on the terrace, how the arms were stretched out to him. He thought, women are always like that. The vagueness of their minds is hopeless. It was a thing he had never been able to understand, but so it was. It had been so with her, his wife. They could not keep anything clearly fixed in their minds. But he had been wrong to be angry with her. Moreover, did he not rather like this vagueness in women? It was part of their extraordinary charm. I will make her smile at me, he thought. She looks frightened. She was so silent. He clutched his fingers and determined that his voice and his face and all the quick, expressive gestures which had been at his command, making people pity him and praise him all these years, should subdue themselves. He would make her smile at him. He would find some simple, easy thing to say to her. But what? For, wrapped up in his work as he was, he forgot the sort of thing one said. There was a puppy. They had a puppy. Who was looking after the puppy today? he asked. Yes, thought James pitilessly, seeing his sister's head against the sail. Now she will give way. I shall be left to fight the tyrant alone. The compact would be left to him to carry out. Cam would never resist tyranny to the death, he thought grimly, watching her face, sad, sulky, yielding. And, as sometimes happens when a cloud falls on a green hillside, and gravity descends, and there among all the surrounding hills is gloom and sorrow, and it seems as if the hills themselves must ponder the fate of the clouded, the darkened, either in pity or maliciously rejoicing in her dismay. So Cam now felt herself overcast, as she sat there among calm, resolute people, and wondered how to answer her father about the puppy, how to resist his entreaty, forgive me, care for me. While James the lawgiver, with the tablets of eternal wisdom laid open on his knee, his hand on the tiller had become symbolical to her, said, resist him, fight him. He said so rightly, justly, for they must fight tyranny to the death, she thought. Of all human qualities she reverenced justice most. Her brother was most godlike, her father most suppliant. And to which did she yield, she thought, sitting between them, gazing at the shore whose points were all unknown to her, and thinking how the lawn and the terrace and the house were smoothed away now, and peace dwelt there. Jasper, 
she said sullenly. He'd look after the puppy. And what was she going to call him, her father persisted. He had had a dog when he was a little boy, called Frisk. She'll give way, James thought, as he watched a look come upon her face, a look he remembered. They look down, he thought, at their knitting or something. Then suddenly they look up. There was a flash of blue, he remembered, and then somebody sitting with him laughed, surrendered, and he was very angry. It must have been his mother, he thought, sitting on a low chair, with his father standing over her. He began to search among the infinite series of impressions which time had laid down, leaf upon leaf, fold upon fold softly, incessantly upon his brain, among scents, sounds, voices harsh, hollow, sweet, and lights passing, and brooms tapping, and the wash and hush of the sea, how a man had marched up and down and stopped dead, upright, over them. Meanwhile, he noticed, Cam dabbled her fingers in the water, and stared at the shore and said nothing. No, she won't give way, he thought. She's different, he thought. Well, if Cam would not answer him, he would not bother her, Mr. Ramsay decided, feeling in his pocket for a book. But she would answer him. She wished passionately to move some obstacle that lay upon her tongue, and to say, Oh yes, Frisk, I'll call him Frisk. She wanted even to say, Was that the dog that found its way over the moor alone? But try as she might, she could think of nothing to say like that, fierce and loyal to the compact, yet passing on to her father, unsuspected by James, a private token of the love she felt for him. For, she thought, dabbling her hand, and now McAllister's boy had caught a mackerel, and it lay kicking on the floor with blood on its gills. For she thought, looking at James who kept his eyes dispassionately on the sail, or glanced now and then for a second at the horizon. You're not exposed to it, to this pressure and division of feeling, this extraordinary temptation. Her father was feeling in his pockets. In another second he would have found his book. For no one attracted her more. His hands were beautiful, and his feet, and his voice, and his words, and his haste, and his temper, and his oddity, and his passion, and his saying straight out before everyone, we perish, each alone, and his remoteness. He had opened his book. But what remained intolerable, she thought, sitting upright, and watching McAllister's boy tug the hook out of the gills of another fish, was that crass blindness and tyranny of his, which had poisoned her childhood and raised bitter storms, so that even now she woke in the night trembling with rage, and remembered some command of his, some insolence. Do this, do that. His dominance, his submit to me. So she said nothing, but looked doggedly and sadly at the shore, wrapped in its mantle of peace, as if the people there had fallen asleep, she thought, were free like smoke, were free to come and go like ghosts. They have no suffering there, she thought. End of section 13